I'm John Bowden. We're up to part two of our interview with Judson McKinney and Shannon Forrest and their brand new band, Judson McKinney and the Wanderers. A very, and I say this a lot when I describe this band, I'm all telling all my friends about it. They're very primal. They sound like the Stones at times. There's a glam rock part of who they are. There's certainly a devil may care part of who they are. But Shannon and Judson have been working on this project for three years. Now, in this clip, we're going to start as we did with the clip yesterday. It's an hour and a half interview where we talk to Shannon Forrest about his career, a lot of Toto, some Steely Dan, Michael McDonald, and then we'll talk about Judson McKinney and the Wanderers in the second part. Shannon's one of my favorite drummers, and I love the way he breaks down things. I love his mind. First, Shannon Forrest on Rock History Book. I come up and I say, Shannon, Steve Lukather is? Luke is? Oh, um, uh, the most intense person in every direction I've ever met, you know? And, 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 and I owe him so much because when I came in in 2014, man, my, I love this about it. I love this about it. When I say there's a certain insanity that is sanity to me, you know what I mean? It's like I got, I showed up that first time. I made an assumption. Now I played with Fagan. You know what I mean? I've done some things. I'm thinking, okay, rehearsals. I'm the new guy in. I'm basically subbing for Keith Carlock temporarily, whatever, you know, there's whatever. And I show up and I left something to chance. Right. I knew the song's cold. I knew the arrangement's cold, but the endings seemed to me that, well, well, that's 13 times around on a vamp. There has to be a cue. There's no way we're accountable to 13 times. You know what I mean? There's got to be a cue. So I'm figuring we'll work the cue out. We'll talk about this. You know what I mean? We'll, 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 and man. The nuclear, I call it nuclear, you know what I mean? The nuclear reaction I got for, for, for that slight amount of unpreparedness was like, man, I mean, like being thrown in a drying machine of, of nerves, you know, discombobulating you. You know what I mean? Like, whoa, now, now play, motherfucker. You know what I mean? Now that you're rattled to your DNA level, now play. You know what I mean? That's the thing that you can't get another way. And look at there's, uh, uh, be, you know, like, again, it's back to that Jeff thing. And all those guys have a, a particular brand of this. Page, Lenny Castro, there's a part of themselves that they never filter, you know? And I'm, I live in Nashville where there's so much filtering going on, you never know where the truth is with someone. You know what I mean? Like, they're, they're, there's nothing but uh, affable Southern hospitality uh, posturing. You know what I mean? And, and, and I don't find it uh, genuine, you know? So I'll take genuine with a fist before I'll take that veiled serpentine thing that I can't trust, you know? And so Luke... Uh, I mean, what I love about him is 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 that he's he just never isn't Steve Lukather. He's just never he's he's all you always get what you get, and there's a certain truth that you can trust to always be present. And that again, that's part of the reason when I said there's only one other place I would go. It's like you know because of that. When I'm there, there is a. It's like for all the pressure that you can feel self-imposed or whatever to, to, to live up to that questioning of, is there, am, is someone misleading me right now? You know what I mean? Am I going to have to read into this? That's not a thing, which feels like clear air to me, you know? But I mean, gosh, I don't know. I couldn't say enough and it's not to, you know, I'd say it to his face and I have, and, and, and guys never like it when you do, you know, but uh, he did more, to wake me back up to myself, right? Uh, like I spent so many years in a community that requires that you uh, uh, subjugate and 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 be so deferential to be able to coexist. You know what I mean? That you don't you lose contact with a certain immediate impression of things. You know, and he he saved me from 
potentially losing myself to that diplomacy. You know what I mean? And as an artist, you just can't. I mean, again, back to discovering my voice and wanting to be who I am, you can't do it without having access to that. And he really, really did, whether he that was his intention or not. When you're around someone as as powerful as that guy is in his voice, and even and 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 they give you their wrath, you know, uh, it's like man, you know, the truth hurts, but man, you can't grow if somebody's not not giving it to you. You know what I mean? And you get to a certain level of something that it takes a certain level above you to be able to bitch slap you when you need it. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, like a, it's, if you're in, if you're the if you're the strongest guy in the room, nobody can correct you. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, I can't say enough about what the regard I hold him in, you know, f- f- for, for all the stories that I'm sure you've heard and everybody, you know what I mean? It's like, well, it, it's seldom to meet anyone genuine, man. That guy is genuine. Right. I, I, uh, 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 my, uh, my son who uh, uh, started drumming after, after a month when he was seven, he said, dad, can I have a real drum teacher? I went, Oh man, that, that really oh, hurt. He's 20 ouch, now. Yes. He's 20 now. And Luke actually saw him play when he was eight. He saw him play the halftime shuffle on, on Rosanna. And he, he, oh, wow. he, he commented on it. Chase was like, oh. and Bruce Hornsby yeah. wrote a long thing one day and he let it go and he's got back to it. But anyway, he, uh, and if he has time, I'm almost done with you. He'll come down and say hi, but yeah, yeah. his name is Chase, but time. Steve in Vancouver, Steve P came up and he knew Chase. He knew about Chase and he sat, sat Chase down on the side. We were all there with Luke and everybody. He sat Chase on the side and he told Chase all about his brother, you know? Oh, uh, wow. Anyway, Chase says it's the moment of my life, but uh, the thing about Luke that I like is uh, the fact that he and and yeah. he was always really so well. He's being fu- he's being funny and real at the same time. Yeah, we don't have enough yeah, of those 100%. people. No, we don't. That's why he, exactly, exactly. Okay, Josh wrote. I, we're really excited to have you back. What drum set or what drum kit are you using? What are you? He wanted to know about your equipment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm using the same set of drums for now. Uh, you know, the call came in, you know, to get something made requires you specific for a tour. I usually, I will bring something visually new to the, to the tour, you know, uh, this set of drums that I played on the 40th anniversary, you know, eight, I played them in 18 and 19 with the guys that set of drums uh, for, for, for the nerd side of things is uh well, you're a drummer, right? I, I played Gretsch drums for forever. You know what I mean? Was never an artist for them. Pearl, uh, a handful of years back, uh, started making their own version of that shell, and they killed it. I mean, it's 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 it it's. I can take. I have an '81 Gretsch kit. When you know, and I can put drums in side the 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 Pearl kit, and you cannot distinguish a difference. As a matter of fact, the Pearl drums are a little better because they ring out a little more, but tonally and response-wise, they're the same. So I'm playing that set again, which is a, a maple gum shell. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm playing slightly bigger toms because I've been on, on that. So for my, my rack toms, which would usually be a 10-inch, a 12-inch, and a 13, which is the same thing Jeff played, I'm playing a 12, a 13, and a 14 in the same spots, you know. And this time around, at least in some of the shows, I'm actually, which is new, is, is a new place for me to go. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be taking some soloing, you know what I mean, which is just not something that anybody's seen me do yet. So you'll really get a taste of 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 where I'm at with that and what those drums are doing, you know, kind of in, in that moment. I mean, a lot of what I do is about sound and note and volume and dynamics. And, and that set of drums is remarkable. Our front of house guy was just kind of jaw dropping. Like we're going, dude, just wait till that's in the big room, man. It's going to be nuts, you know? So that's uh, it. Peisty symbols. Uh, the, uh, right now I'm using the same setup as I did before, which are uh, dark energy crashes and a couple of modern essential right symbol, hi hat and a China, uh, I may change some of that out, but it's to, subject to availability from Pisces. So for those guys knowing that's what that is, Remo heads, ambassadors on everything. And uh, I have my own stick that I didn't do any uh, stumping for. Uh, that's a really good design. This innovative percussion makes my stick. And, and, and 
you know, a lot of drummers get off in this esoteric thing of trying to design a stick that likes like, well, I mean, I don't need it to play backwards. You know what I mean? Like it, it's uh, my design was about what we've had. What's happened is that new growth uh, wood, that fast growth wood that they're using, that they harvest for making things. It's much less dense than wood even from the nineties was right. So my stick weight uh, for an 8A, which I've always used, uh, the stick weight was starting to drop to the, you know, 10 or 15% sometimes in, in, in overall weight. So my stick design redistributes some mass toward the front of the stick. So you get the the fulcrum feel of, of a heavier stick with a lighter weight, you know. So if people want to check that stick out, it's not a self-indulgent crawl up my ass thing. It's 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 a... It's addressing uh, uh, a design flaw that's due to the change of, of the nature of wood. So that's a cool thing. Yeah. You worked with Taylor Swift. She seems to be in the news lately. I don't know. I might have. I might have heard a few things. Uh, I'm, maybe I'm mistaken. It could have been another artist, though. <laughs> I mean, listen. If you want to, one of our new songs has taken that on, and it's not. You know, like everybody. We got everybody's got to pick sides on everything. You know what I mean? Everybody's That's why I don't talk politics side. on my channel. Well, the problem is, and real simply, is like they've they've split conflicting issues across party lines so that you can't you can't achieve change, right? So some things that don't belong in one party are are purposefully held over there so that we can't get underneath and change the outcome of the establishment. Short short answer, right? Uh, Judson and I are always, man. I mean, I think rock and roll, man. If you're not, I think of it more like Roger Waters, maybe a little bit. Like if you're not, we don't do it. In a, we, none of those songs do you feel like, oh, fuck, political, right? I mean, you're not feeling like that. But nope. but it does have a, a, a sentiment to it, you know? The Taylor thing, I can say quick, you know, kind of short and uh, concise. I mean, I, I, I met her the first time when she was 15. I played on some songs for her before her career broke. We had a particular day together that the last time she had never forgotten because uh, uh, she they had her for the same reasons that I told you I didn't like the industrial thing. We were recording all day. It was uh, it was with an established Nashville songwriter, you know, who was producing and Napoleon Dynamite the movie had just come out. Right. And so I'm always finding ways to amuse myself on these vapid sessions. You know what I mean? And the band, you know. So I was mimicking the character Kip who has this lisp, you know what I mean? And every time I would do that in the headphones, she'd go, who's doing that? And she'd be ca cracking up, you know? So we get to the end of the day and we record a song that, and I've always been this way, whatever, for better or worse, you know, uh, it's just, uh, I, I, I will, we're accountable as musicians on some level to speak the truth even at our peril, you know what I mean? It, it, when, when it comes down to it. And so we got to the, the last song we did on that particular day was the by far the best. Now the best for her, you know what I'm saying? Like it was the best thing we did that day. I'm not over investing in how deep it was. It was just the best thing we did that day. I said, Hey Taylor, where'd this song come from? You know, she's, Oh, well I wrote that one. I said, I told her and she always remembered this at least from the last time I ran into her. Uh, I said, you know, well, that's the best song we recorded today. You should be recording your own songs, you know? And so, so the, the, the fact that she does that uh, is, is accurate. Now, as a father of a 12 year old daughter and observing these things in a peculiar way and in the kind of Orwellian feeling universe we're we're occupying right now you know the bandwidth of that has not changed you know what i mean like 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 what that was that day it still is at 30 plus years old and i find that to be troubling you know that, that that's i'm not attacking her on that on that level i think there's a component about her that's that because of the way she grew up and stardom at a certain age i i equate it to, i tell people i i look at it kind of like what michael jackson had i believe that some of his struggles were more based on the fact that he was never advanced he was in a certain kind of uh, uh 
growth that we get. He was not given access to the things that that expands you, right? I think in a in a, in a very unnefarious way. That's a part of of what that is, what the Taylor thing is to me, and watching it, it's sort of it's having a stunting effect on 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 certain things, you know what I mean? But, th- but that's a huge conversation we can get into. I don't know what just happened right there. Yeah, I saw know. I just saw that. Wait, what? Okay, I well, didn't do it. See, okay, Don Henley, Cass County. What was that experience yeah. like? Um, you know. Another one of those things that was, I only played on one track or two maybe that I recall. Um, Don being, you know, a great drummer and a great drummer for the song and a great stylist in the way that he plays, you know. Uh, He was very appreciative, but uh, people, that's what I say, back to the Judson thing, okay? Same DNA, right? these, These people are not the most comfortable people, but not in a bad way. But people tend to read into their peculiarities and call them dark or um, self selfish or or whatever it happens to be. It's like no, this guy is just actually so so much a unique person that it's a struggle. You know what I mean? But it's not it's not angry. People kind of think of it as bitter. He just was like very flat, you know. Very and and. I would miscast it if I said dark because I hear people say that a lot. I'm going, no, intense and dark are not the same thing, you know? And a guy who's measured in in their expectation, they're not going to give you praise, you know, in that affable way that everybody's like, no, things are understood. You know, he had me play drums on his record. I mean, if I'm there, it's understood that, you know what I mean? But it, it's it's never... I never like encountering that necessarily. The better story I have that made me feel good about Don Henley is I played on a Trisha Yearwood record when I was about 28, you know? And they had him come in and be a guest singer on it. And the producer, because he knew it would have meant something to me, uh, he goes, yeah, man, Don played on that track. Uh, Don sang on that track. And he said, man, he stopped. He stopped us and, and asked who the drummer was. He said, man, it sounds like Jeff Vaccaro, you know? So... So that's my that's my that's my more shiny Don Henley you know moment you know but uh, but the other thing was just like it was it was very uneventful you know what I mean I just showed up I played in a drum booth he was recording at a studio that uh, 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 Garth Brooks records were recorded in which is not a particularly great studio you know what I mean it was just like I'm in a booth it's kind of dead a little bit un- uninspired sounding, you know what I mean? I'm just playing a train beat, you know, but you know, it's Don Henley, you know, it's, it's uh, that's been, again, that's why I've been, you know, with my work and what I'm trying to do is like, man, you know, me having a credit for Don Henley for that track is not the same as having a credit for dirty laundry. It's not the same. You know what I mean? Those two things are not equal, you know? And so, you know, I'm grateful that, you know, to have been involved. And that's not a critique of Don's work. I'm saying on me, you know what I'm of saying? Course. Like, like the, the, the song didn't have the bandwidth, uh, not in a bad way. It just wasn't one of those, you know what I mean? So it's less of a, there's probably a reason people don't know that drum track, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but they know Dirty Laundry, you know? Jeff Scott Baxter told me, he says, as a studio musician, I've talked to him quite a few times. He says, you go in there and you, you make it easy for the artist. It's not always the most pleasant experience for you, but you got to look for the song and for the artist. And he says, that's, yeah. he says, I've had a lot of tough sessions, but that's yeah. my job. Is that how you looked yeah. at it when you were doing the session work? Yeah, I always, I always looked at it like, well, I'm not here to play for me. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm here. If I can insinuate something about me into it, then, then great. That comes down to just time and feel and maybe arrangement choices, but but to like really stretch out and uh, and overreach, that's that's failure, you know. And and even even in how you handle, for me, how you handle um, suggestions, you know, particularly from the artist, you know, uh, the first thing I will do is always try to 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 create a functional version of what they're asking me for, 
You know what I mean? And 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 then if I feel like it, I'm not there like going, I ain't going to play that because that's going to make me look bad. I mean, there I have warned people at times. I've literally said to some younger artists at, at when I was doing lesser and lesser sessions and because it was needed to be said, I said, you know, I, I, I'm happy to play that for you, but you might want to look for the opportunity for someone to play the next thing that the next person asked them to play. You know what I mean? Like, like, because it was so, what we were doing was done so many times. It's like, yes, that will work. You know what I mean? But there's nothing about it that belongs to you. You know what I mean? And, 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 but it, most of the time I won't even go that far. If I can make what they're asking me to do feel musical, I'll just play it. You know, there's a, a word that I don't use very often in music. There's a primal, it's funny, I was just talking to a lady who wrote a book on Yoko Ono yesterday, and we're talking about primal screaming uh, about with John. Uh, there's a primal side to this stuff. I mean, uh, Liberty Bells, uh, so true, g glammy. Mm -hmm. I remember going, this yep. is kind of, yep. this is like Mott the Hoople meets Sweet meets 2023. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Tell me about, well, uh, tell me about uh, well, before we go into Liberty Bells, uh, so true. Tell me about that one. That was another title where Shannon said, uh, hey, man, uh, can, can you come up with something that's like where it's like you're so true, you know? And then I started noticing everybody on social media is like, so true, girl, you know, so true. And he really wanted me to take this sort of uh, hard line angle on the sarcasm, which I don't think I ended up doing. It's a little bit more maybe the feeling of it's a little bit more ambiguous, but it almost feels more menacing that way. I think well, the, the, and the beauty of that process uh, is that, you know, I was very reluctant uh, to participate in writing. Uh, I was, I had been doing more and more of it when I met Judson, but when, when we met, it was just like, all right, well, I just got to get, get over that and, and just really apply myself. And so when I would bring something to the room, I desperately hope that he's going to bend it away from my own understanding of the idea. And that's when you get something really unique is when you get, you truly get a collaboration where there's a particular point of entry into a thought, but now it's affected by two or, you know, or more uh, points of view. And then it becomes unique, but there's a couple of really cool things. If you got some, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking, you know, we're inundated with so much stuff, you know, like, you know, they're talking about like, you know, possible conscription in Europe and World War Three and God knows what. And so I think the idea of that song is just kind of like <laughs> so true. It's like, hold my beer while I watch the nuclear you know, explosion. Right. And, and one more thing. Dig this, you, you know, about that track. That's <clears throat> remarkable. OK. We uh, we don't record to a click track, right? We we'll, we start writing, and if we get a feel on something, I'll go play it on the drums while he maybe plays guitar with me on the basic first riff idea. And then I'll go into that, and I'll listen to that drum, and I'll make a loop of whichever measures feel really good, you know? And then as we write, you know, we use that as what I call like post-it notes. And so I'll create, a you know, three minutes of enough of that groove, and then we we write the song to that. Now, we wrote that song before Russia invaded Ukraine, okay? Uh, that had not happened yet. Uh, one of the remarkable things, and this has happened with my work with Judson and our time together, so many times I'm tired of it. I'm, I'm it's like, all right, all right, all right. I'm listening. I keep, I'm, I'm continuing to work because you keep showing me these cosmic, synchronicities. Is what talking about. Talking about these synchronicity right? moments. So the choices in there in the bridge was the last thing we inserted, which kind of has this Bowie S thing where he goes into this spoken word commentator. You know what I mean? The voice of all this stuff. Well, on one speaker, right? I grabbed some audio that's Stalin. It's Stalin is one speaker. This is before Russia invaded Ukraine, right? Ho Chi Minh is in the other one, right? And then there's a literal German uh, uh, parade march with tanks and shit in there that, again, across this tempo that is not set on anything that we did other than feel, that fucking parade from 1938 stays in sync with our track for 16 measures, you know what I mean? And that was one of the first instances of what the fuck is happening. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. and so it's a really cool thing, you know? 
A year before the war. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Tell me about Liberty Bells. I had, used to have a music teacher who used to say, he says, that, that, that it's real, real music. I said, what, what, what's real music? He's all the stuff here on the radio. But the real, real music is the stuff that really grabs you, right? Yeah. So that's the yeah. thing about this project, guys, that, you know, I was so pleasantly surprised. And when I was getting here late, just speeding, trying to get here on time to my house, I'm going, I don't want to miss this. This is so good. Uh, Liberty Bells. Yeah. Tell me about that one. Well, it's a start a song that I started writing uh, in in the car. I, I often write uh, in a mantra like way when I'm driving, and that Liberty Bells in the power when rain. You know that just kept going on and on in my head, and gradually, just as I would drive, I would start to fill in different lyrics. And so I pretty much brought that intact to Shannon's studio, and uh, you know we just flushed out a production for it. You know we added a chorus, which is really kind of like a refrain it's and and we you know we added some muscle in the guitars and mm. you know um that was a particularly great uh somewhere down the line and we're going to go back in and retitle some of these live videos so it's not such a deep dive <laughs> but there's an extremely uncomfortable six hours of us finding that chorus like like well it's got to have a chorus it's got to release you know uh so there's two things one of the first things we did in in my room here, I didn't know what to play. He was playing me that song on, on on a Telecaster and singing it. And so I just played four on the floor. That was the first thing that made sense. I was like, I'm just going to play along with him while he while we document this song as one we possibly will work on, right? Well, that vocal is the vocal he sang in that room when I was just playing bass drum. So we, we made that record around that vocal performance because when you hear that vocal performance, it's... Those verses are just it's it's epic communication level. You know what I mean? It's so so we didn't touch that. We insert you inserted a chorus, you know, we created that thing, and then we just made the record around it, you know. Is this an EP that's coming out? And when's it coming out? Well, I, I'd like to get it out as soon as possible. Uh we're we're we got a couple uh bows uh to tie on how we want to do it, I suppose, but I'd like to get it out. Well, that's the soon. that's the that's the thing. We we the music is up on Spotify. There is a JMW, you know, Judson McKinney and the Wonders on Spotify. You can listen to those tracks there. We've been fighting that battle uh moving forward and we've done I won't bore your audience with this, but the analytical study, not the obvious shit that people know that Spotify is bad for artists. There's other shit going on in a, in an uh, algorithmic way that has to do with more industrial powered shit. So our mu our music is there to call things a release. It's like I keep I keep reinforcing and encourage him like look the music isn't new to us, but it's still new to the world. You know like when people go, "Oh, my new single's coming out." It's like, "No, it's not." You know, you're uploading to the internet like you and 8 billion other people. You know what I'm saying? Like so until we get a certain uh bandwidth, I you know figuring out what the release is you can go listen to the music now the audience you know if, they, if people want to go check out the music those tunes are there we're completing a bunch of new work man that if you like that stuff wait till you hear what we're on to now you know what i mean and what we're going to do today uh you know probably when we get off of here is we're going to go into our youtube channel and just playlist all our official videos so basically those are full records like you know the video for liberty bells the video for uh champion of losers which is our latest one um you know so true so you know people can can dig into what we've we've got out there have you heard champion of Los losers yet have you did because that one doesn't show up in the same places as the other ones uh, uh what's the what's the video where you guys you guys are in the back of a pickup or something going through the that's street? it that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. that's it <laughs> <laughs> right on yeah. While I was talking to That's him, go, right. oh crap, I forgot to put that song's title because I watched it this yeah. morning. Um, tell me what what's the song you sample or you you do in the beginning? What's what's what is that? Yeah, we we tip the hat to 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 loser. Uh, you know, remember the Beck the Beck song? Right. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. I wasn't the biggest Beck fan, so I wasn't. I thought I know that song, but I don't know that song. Yeah, yeah. Tell well, me about that tune. Yeah, uh, it, it was another, uh, you know, another situation where Shannon says, "Hey, man, uh, can, can you write a song called Champion of Losers?" And uh, I, my mind, 
instantly started going to my recon down on Broadway. I was like, oh, wow, there's a whole movie of a movie of experience that I've I've had just being in that. Uh, I mean, and Nashville has been roaring, dude. I don't know when's the do you get down to Nashville much? No, no. Oh, man, it's been nuts the past couple of years because Nashville was a big getaway from the COVID stuff because it was pretty much open. So people started pouring in. And I, that's when I was down there, basically, you know, ha hacking away at it. And so I had all these experiential things from that time down there. And it just seems like this epic tale of something, you know, <laughs> it's, it's it, 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 it it's, it's auto it's autobiographical for him in one regard and then if you you the more you listen to our stuff you'll understand sometimes i say we're just a couple of fucks you know what i mean uh, uh giving our point of view you know what i mean it's 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 always a lot it's some satire in there but it's kind of the it's kind of the cosmic uh, calamity of truth you know what i mean and and so it, in one regard it kind of takes you down the streets of nashville but it's it's really kind of going this ain't what it seems you know if you check those lyrics man on, on those verses when he's talking about uncle john's band with charlie mingus it's it's like the struggle of being on stage in a room where people only want like a wind up redneck to play a, a to play a cover song you know what i mean and here's this guy you know uh, uh laying it on people that's why i sent him down there said look you know, go down there and win the room that doesn't want you. You know what I mean? Because that's really what we're going to be fighting for our lives. You know what I mean? You got to you got to go down there and figure out how to be the full Judson, even when you're getting negative feedback. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that song's based on that right kind of idea. But with this bigger bow on the end of it, of all these failed ideas like, you know, when you and it really tangles you up in a way of thinking about these concepts, which is important to both of us. It's like, well, if you say Jesus Christ in your upper room and you're talking about champion of losers, it's a real triggering thing to say to try to figure out, well, what the fuck does he mean by that? Well, is he saying Jesus Christ is a loser or, well, not really, because because he did kind of take it, you know what I mean? But it's like the misinterpretation of what people can, can you know, perceive as being a champion of something. And, and then him being down there on the street in this autobiographical kind of experiential place. And then making that record was, I've never done anything like that. We did that song completely out of sequence. We sat and, and with, a, with books and, and, he kept coming up with uh, verse after verse after verse of experience. There, well, there was there's a place uh, that's no longer called the Broadway Brew House uh, in Midtown, but man, for the longest time you could go in there. It was still a smoking bar. You go in, you could have a smoke, have a have a drink, and man, I would stay up there and just you know just be writing in these books, you know, just writing uh, my experience and just collecting collecting lines, collecting uh snippets collect and that's kind of how that song gradually it started coming together you know with with all those different with books and it kind of has a feel like like almost like a film in a way and we flesh those things out we sit here and we go well that which which that phrase kind of actually lives with this phrase and 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 now it starts to paint this scenario in, into focus i mean it just i like to say we, there there's something that that's about Judson that's very from the beginning for me is Quentin Tarantino esque, you know. So we we endeavored to get our music in front of him because Judson, you know, in the creative process, even I, I remark all the time is like things arrive out of sequence, you know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, but they have continuity and they always make sense at the end of the process, but it doesn't come in. Uh, in a linear fashion, like like a lot of people, you know, uh, look at things, and then that's the time that we spend sorting throughout, sometimes and structuring the you know organization of things. But yeah, that track is a, and it's particularly that video, because just so you know, the audience man, it's such hard work to do something these days. We make those videos ourselves. We fucking learned Final Cut Pro. We edited all of that together. I fucking took cymbal stands and created like three positions on the back of that truck. You know what I mean? And Judd said, I wanted to go downtown and drive on a flatbed truck. And go, I don't know if we well, can you, do that. He bought you know? the damn truck for the video. Yeah, I bought the truck and painted the truck and put the thing on it and put the cameras on it. 
to make that idea come to life, you know? But anyway, what's, so what's, you know, what's coming up for you guys? Like you're going to continue recording new music. Yeah, we've, we've got a bunch of new tracks. Uh, he's about to go out uh, with Toto. So we, we had a window where it's like, Whoa, we got to get this done, baby. Yeah. And so we've got, I guess, you know, about three days to wrap some major tracks up. I mean, we're talking major you, tracks. You know, and and I, all our work that exists that you've heard, it is at a level. Uh, two guys working together for three years, just imagine our best work beyond what you've already heard. Like, like, okay, this is this is the next gear. You know what I mean? So it's built on all the 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 guardrails of that groove and and that efficiency and that thing. But they're they're bigger they're bigger ideas in their release. You know what I mean? They're 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 bigger in their musical bandwidth uh, or uh, in some ways, and bigger in their thought bandwidth. You know? Wow, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. So so when you get, I mean, do you? I, I never looked at the the dates. Uh, are there plans yeah. for you guys? Do you have like breaks in the Journey Toto thing? Do yes, you know? totally. Yes. And so you know, and that's part of where the process is. And and your audience, man, if if they're digging what we're doing, every bit of support that we can get reciprocates what we're trying to do. Puts eyes on what we're doing. Puts eyes back on Toto. Puts you know what I mean. All these things work together. The creative part, we we're, we're about to put will be 16 songs in that are all at minimal quality of what you've already heard. Right. And so for a, yeah, for a body of work, that's that. And now the time when I'm in Toto, my day job is, is going to be business outreach and booking and getting us booked in all those additional place, you know what I mean? All time frames. So mm -hmm. uh, those gigs are, will be coming, you know, and, uh, and, and, yeah, in a way to in a way a great way to follow us if you're digging this and you're watching this and and thanks John again for you know having me on if you're into this and you, this sounds exciting to you uh, jmwofficial.com you can actually sign up you can do it either uh, if you want to do it with an email that's great um, we also have a phone list you can sign up with your phone if you just if that's easier for you um, less spam. And uh, so that's a great way to just kind of figure out what's going on with this. And obviously subscribing to our YouTube channel keeps because you can see right. us work, you know, on if, what we're doing. If your interest is peaked, uh, you know, and you're checking this out and if it's in, in real time, the next thing we're doing is work. We're working on the true crime song and we'll be it we will be live on our channel the rest of the day. You know what I mean? So that's kind of the nature of how this thing works. There are links in the description where you can get more information on Shannon and Judson McKinney and their band, all their social media. Check out their videos. Uh, Shannon is also filming from the road when he's with Toto. We're hoping to get an on-camera interview with him when he comes to Calgary on March 7th. And remember, if you want to donate to the channel, there's a PayPal link. If you want to join our newsletter, you'll get informed when we release something because YouTube doesn't always let our 128,000 subscribers know what we're doing. Not sure why. Subscribe to our channel, share our videos, like them, and comment on them as well. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Book. <laughs>